Okay, the scope of yesterday's lesson was all about natural selection. We learned a few things. Number one, for natural selection to occur, we need variation. Okay? Without variation in a population, there's nothing to select for or against. Where does variation come from? Mutations. Yeah? Variation comes from mutations. We also learn that other than a population being varied, another factor needs to be in place so that there is selection. Among these variations, some of the traits will have selective advantage. Some of them do not have selective advantage. Yeah, we don't really talk about those. Huh? But all this talk about selective advantage or a disadvantage doesn't quite make sense unless there's a pressure. So these were the terms that we learned yesterday. We learned that for natural selection to take place, the starting point in the population will require variation. No variation, there's really nothing to select for. As Christine pointed out yesterday, actually if they're all the one and the same, the right selection pressure can wipe out the whole population. But because there's variation, some of us or the population may have the advantage, some do not. Those with the selective advantage will be selected for. Those without will be selected against. And this really boils down to whether we have a pressure or not. In the example of the pocket mines, if we take away the hawks, the eagles, the predators, technically, all of them will remain brown color, or black color, or whatever variation exists will persist if we take away the selection pressure. Your skill as a student is to be able, if you provide your context, tell me and identify which trait has advantage, what is the selection pressure. Usually it's like that, okay? Provide your context. Do I have an example of such a question? So what is the other question? Three. Here's an example of a question related to natural selection. Question two. They say industrial melanism describes a change in peppered moth color from light to dark color. Which statement is true about peppered moths? And a four statements there, some testing your uh, misconceptions of the chapter. Okay, so this is a simple question. We won't go through this answer for now. Today, we're going to continue on with where we left off yesterday or try to start. The idea of artificial selection. What part of this name persists, the word selection. At the end of the day, there's still some sort of selection. But, in the case that we're going to look at today, why do we call it artificial? As compared to natural. So this is where we left off. Um, I'd just like you to pay attention to this video. See if you can spot or try to identify what Traits have a selective advantage when we are looking at artificial selection. What is the selection pressure when we are looking at artificial selection?
muscle is done 84 degrees, except that in terms of quantity, each of these muscles is by far more developed.
then you will see what all the modern day versions of this plant look like today. And you believe it or not, all the vegetables you see are actually they are more related than you think. So, mustard plant. Did you know that cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kale, they all came from the same ancestor? from one plant that has been selectively bred over many generations to get what you see here. Essentially, when you eat these fellas, you are eating the same plant, just artificially bred for a particular trait we prefer. Holy flowers are actually a head of lots of flowers not in bloom. Broccoli, a head of flowers not in bloom, artificially bred that way. Cabbage, we emphasize the the parts that have a lot of leaves. Kale, we emphasize the parts of leaves that are extremely huge. And so on and so forth. Uh, this particular vegetable kind of emphasizes the stems. So actually, uh, believe it or not, if you cook a plate of vegetables comprising cabbage, broccoli, kale, actually you think the same thing. Just artificially bred in many directions. They are almost like the dog of the vegetable world. Yeah, different breeds of dog are uh, actually different breeds of mustard plants. All artificially bred in one direction. Advantages? Uh, there's a question mark. It's always subjective when it comes to humans. Because what's advantages? Uh, we need we made to be. Um, and modern day scientists have also realized that actually when we select for a particular trait, we don't know what we are missing out. Actually, nutritionally speaking, lots of the vegetables used to eat in the supermarket we lack the nutrients that you find in the wild version of these plants. We end up selecting for things that superficially and taste-wise taste good, but on a nutrient level, the level we cannot see, those are things, those are the things you cannot see, we end up not selecting for. There are some people that are trying to go back to the roots, um, looking for vegetables and plants that you can find in the wild to maximize the nutrients you can get. Some people are going back to what we call heirloom varieties. And when you look at the you know, supermarket, have you ever seen a box of tomatoes for heirloom tomatoes? Look at the variety of tomatoes that you can find if you look at the wild version. Beautiful, right? So many colors. Although not quite nice in shape, kind of oblong, bulbous in some areas, look like pumpkin, some tiny. But each one with different nutritional value, different colour, different taste. A group of um, yeah, people who are trying to find such varieties again, we discover the nutritional value that we may be losing as a result of eating and artificially breeding over the years. So two forms of selection we've learned so far that can really change the cause of proportion of variation within the population. First, defined by the environment. Selection pressure that is unscrupulous. You live or you die based on whether your trait is truly advantageous or not. Then there's those that's artificial in nature, defined by us. Need not be good or bad to the individual, but is at least good, or at least defined good by the humans themselves. I think that base is, is nice and cute to me, um, and I slowly bring in that direction. So, two different forms of variation. For yourself, I hope, or I need you, to be able to differentiate between the two. Artificial and natural selection. That is at least your, your baseline goal. Okay, um, we will skip all these additional questions, whether it's better or not. Um, truly, uh, better or not, we, we are not sure unless we compare to what natural selection has. Let down. Some questions to try. Okay. Uh, next week we will go into the very last part of the chapter, genetic engineering. This takes a lot of time. Truth be told, natural or artificial, we need many generations, hundreds of years. But we have hacked the system. We know how to make things faster. Next week's topic is all about genetic engineering. Yeah, and I think that we covered it a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, genetic engineering is really about going to what we know. Actually, everything is locked in our genes. Why not we just modify it at the start? 
what if I the sperm, what if I the egg, what if I the zygote? That saves us a lot of trouble from going through many generations. If we already know this gene codes for something, why don't we just insert it in? So that is the scope of next week. I'll share with you about the technologies, perhaps you already know from your research on how we can change it. Okay, we'll take a short break now. I think it's melting. It's a hot day. And I bought some uh, icicles. So I'd like everyone to choose an icicle.